So Manfred should be telling us about analyzing the dynamics of message passing algorithms using statistical mechanics. And we okay. see the slides and the stage is yours, Manfred. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, hi to everyone. And uh, so I'm going to talk uh, about um, ongoing work uh, with my postdoc, uh, Barak Chakmak. And uh, so the background is of course uh, approximate inference. Uh, and uh, so in general, um, we have to deal um, with intractable probability distributions when we have data. So joint probability of, obs of observations and some latent variables that could be in a Bayesian analysis. And we have to deal with posteriors over the things that we don't know, given uh, what we know. And one of the major problems is, of course, uh, to compute explicitly marginals for a high dimensional problem. So if X is high dimensional, we try to uh, marginalize out all other uh, variables um, xj, which are not equal to xi, and there is often a problem. And in um, the last, uh, whatever, 20 years, more than 20, I guess, um, statistical mechanics has contributed quite a lot in developing techniques um, for doing this task, approximately. And I'm going to look into uh, sort of a approximate um, um, method that is known as the TAP mean field approach, and especially algorithms for computing this TAP mean field approach that are uh, typically called AMP, approximate message passing, at least uh, similar uh, to those. So the problem that I'm going to discuss is uh, study- Alfred, we, we still see your first slide, is that correct? No, no, it should not be. Now you see the second, right? But is it the... just me? I still see the title slide with the authors. Oh, goodness. How come? I'm doing screen. Now, now it's okay. Now I see machine learning background approximate oh. inference. And now the, the next one? Still machine learning background approximate inference. Oh, is that the right one? No, I have something. It's called the problem. No. no, no. Slide two that you have now. Now we see the problem. Maybe now it's still not. Two. Maybe it's slow. Okay. I don't know how that comes. Uh, okay. So maybe I should just say now the next. Uh, uh, yeah. Going to come. Okay. So the problem that I'm going to discuss is uh, algorithms uh, for approximate inference uh, for typical uh, uh, problems in in large systems and the way. Uh, we try to model typicality for large system is to make some sort of uh, structured random matrix assumption. So um, we think about uh, Tom's talk um, before mine. So he's making certain Gaussian assumptions on data. So we make certain random matrix assumptions on other ingredients uh, of, of, of these models. And we will specialize to dynamical properties of algorithms and especially uh, um, talk about a tool that is known as the dynamical functional mode uh, method that has been um, sort of another cornerstone of uh, um, um, statistical physics of disordered problems besides uh, the replica method for statics. So this is a method for dealing uh, with dynamics. So I'll try to get the next slide um, with the outline. So is it there? No. But it will come. It's just slow. Not sure. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. We have it. Yeah. Yes. It's just now slow. We have it. So don't worry about it. Just yeah, click into the head. I think it's got the timing. So press the button when I still talk. Okay. So the outline of the talk is I'm going to introduce uh, some of the models that I'm going to talk about essentially simple Ising. Well, I mean, um, Ising models, Gaussian latent models. And uh, they're very much related uh, to uh, Ton's uh, generalized linear models and also uh, restricted Boltzmann machines. Then I'll uh, talk about um, TAP equations briefly, which are the mean field equations for inference, and then uh, introduce an AMP style algorithm and uh, discuss how that can be studied 
using the dynamical functional approach. I'll show some results and try to give some interpretation uh, why it was reasonably simple uh, what we got out. And uh, so I move to the next slide. No. I think you'll need to get out of, of full screen, yes. There? Get stuck if... when in full screen. So we're Manfred, we... stay out of full screen, then oh. it's okay. Okay, stay out of full screen. Okay. Yes, this is okay. But okay. You see Ising model. It's let okay. me try this. Uh, how do I go from full screen? Wait a minute, I'll share again. Oh, yeah. So would I, do I have to un, do I have to un, uh, uh, share it and then go into, wait a minute, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing for a second. Okay. I'll get the, wait a minute, wait a minute, not sharing, wait a minute, sorry. I'll try to, so let me try without full screen mode like this. Yeah, but that's, that's not a good one. Uh, full screen, read mode, display. I don't know. So if I'll do this, uh, if I'll do, okay. So do I have it? Do you see anything? Uh, we, we see, see your, your files. We the see files. your folder with the files. Uh, that's not very interesting. So you should, uh, maybe I'll, and uh, then I have to stop share and start sharing again, I guess. So you think it's a problem of uh, a full screen? Um, so this is better. Yeah. So if I'll do so, this. So move. So if I'll yes, do. Yes, that works. That's, yeah. that's yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry. it goes, yeah. Uh, in my online lectures, it always worked with full screen. So sorry then. Uh, okay, yeah. So I'm starting with a, a very simple model, the Ising model, and often machine learning called the Boltzmann machine. So it's a model of interacting spins where the variables S are plus minus one. And if you would call uh, the computation of the magnetization uh, um, uh, inference, so that would be a simple form of inference uh, for this type of model. Other things might be um, posterior distributions of unobserved uh, parameters in a model that I would call a Gaussian latent variable model where this parameter is Gaussian distributed, K is the covariance matrix. So you could think in terms, for instance, Gaussian processes, and you have a likelihood term that is usually not Gaussian for observations, YI uh, condition on the theta I. And if you think of a, a concrete example, you could think of a, a single layer perceptron where you have some inputs X, you have a weight vector W, and if you put a Gaussian prior on the Ws, you would see that the parameter theta x w would have a distribution like this. And so this is uh, this would be uh, a generalized linear model if you want, and you would write it in this way in 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 terms of a Gaussian latent variable model. So it's essentially the same. Another example that we got interested in is a restricted Boltzmann machine. Now. We have uh, two types of spins, S1 and S2, so two vectors of spins, and they are coupled on a bipartite graph. So you have this coupling between S1 and S2, these are external fields, and you use them as a data model where you assume uh, that S1 are observed values and the S2 are latent variables. So you average out the S2. Um, uh, to get the data model uh, for S1. And uh, so typically uh, one of the talks that, uh, one of the tasks that people might be interested in learning the couplings of the restricted Boltzmann machines by using a maximum likelihood estimator. And again, as you see in this morning uh, in Beth's talk, so if you calculate gradients of uh, the log likelihood, you usually get a sum of two terms. The one term is so, the so-called uh, uh, clamped um, um, average. So where you have here, the, um, this, this means uh, an, an, an average using the conditional expectations of the S2s given S1 and S1D are the data values. 
So typically this part is easily computable because the distribution over S2 uh, factorizes. So the bad thing is this expectation and that expectation is done over uh, this Gibbs distribution in the restricted Boltzmann machine. So that it doesn't contain the data, but it is, uh, you have to calculate these averages um, with this distribution. And so that makes them, uh, this thing interesting, uh, can we compute uh, expectations under that distribution? So these are the three models that we've been looking a little bit into. And um, so the question is, what kind of method, approximate uh, um, inference method are we using? And um, kind of the uh, mother of uh, these generalized mean field equations um, for me as always the TAP or Thales, Anders and Palmer set of equations, self-consistent equations for magnetizations um, here for Ising models with random couplings. So you have here a part which you would call the naive mean field. Um, and here is the so-called Onzaga reaction term. So that couples the magnetization of spin I um, to something that is related to the susceptibility. And the interesting thing for inference is that we know inference, well, the computation of the magnetization is exact in a high temperature phase for the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model where these JIJ couplings are random IID. And here I scale the temperature uh, uh, in, into the size of the couplings in the limit n to infinity. So it's, uh, it's, it seems to be a desirable kind of mean field theory, at least for such uh, classes of random problems. And um, so of course we make a very strong assumption again that all the couplings in the problem, so the randomness in the couplings is completely independent. And uh, in our work, we try to go a little bit beyond that, uh, allowing for a little bit structure in the randomness. So in these matrix that we are considering, um, we go a little step further and say, we look at rotational invariant ensembles. So that's a kind of model that is quite popular in, in information theory. So the idea would be to say, okay, of course, matrices will depend on eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And um, so let's say, we can specify the spectrum, so we can have an idea what the spectrum might be of the matrix, but we're completely ignorant about the eigenvectors and say they are sort of in a general position. And one way of modeling that would be to say, okay, random matrices can be written uh, as an orthogonal matrix times a diagonal one that contains the spectrum, another uh, the same orthogonal matrix and assume that the randomness is in the orthogonal matrix, assuming this is just a random rotation. So that would be the model where we go a little bit away from the uh, IID assumption of matrix elements. And so we have a whole class uh, of, of models where we just specify the spectrum uh, and say eigenvectors are sort of not interesting. There's nothing interesting, no interesting direction in that problem. And uh, of course that uh, excludes uh, sparse matrices that are um, uh, lie in a different uh, model class. And you make similar assumptions for uh, the matrix K in a Gaussian latent variable model. So that's also an assumption you can make there. And then for doing computations, again, we do something similar to what Ton assumed in the previous talk. We assume that there, we have a, a teacher student uh, matching and we're not uh, uh, going beyond that um, uh, in any way. For the um, restricted Boltzmann machine, you can, you have of course a rectangular random matrix. And uh, so one way of doing it, uh, um, generalizing this uh, structured randomness is to say, okay, the random matrix is built out of uh, um, two, um, random orthogonal matrices and sigma contains uh, the, the, the singular values. And again, you specify singular values if you want by your model and uh, assume the rest 
the left and right eigenvectors are kind of pointing in some random direction. So that's the basis of uh, this model class. Okay, so what does it change when you go, uh, um, when you go into this TAP mean field equations when you do that? Uh, you can show that simply for the Ising model and that was done a long time ago by Giorgio Parisi and Mark Potters. Um, it's the same thing. You get uh, a naive mean field uh, term and you get a reaction term. And the thing that is in front of the reaction term is something that is um, this guy, Rj of uh, susceptibility is the only element that comes uh, from the random matrix ensemble and that can be computed in a, in, a, in, a, in a specific way. I'm not going to, into details. So this is something where the spectrum goes in. And uh, um, since you also know the susceptibility by solving the replica theory exactly, so you can pre-compute this kind of object if you know what the spectrum of the random matrix is. And so that's all I'm going to say about uh, what this is. So it, that depends on the actual model but that's the only way where the model comes in. Okay, so you get things that are looking a, a little bit uh, different uh, for the restricted Boltzmann machines. Now you have these two vectors of spins of different dimensionality. You get a uh, coupled, uh, um, you get a coupled systems of TAP equations. And so we wrote this down. Uh, actually, yeah, my, my postdoc managed to get this done. Um, yeah, it involves a little bit uh, more complicated calculations, uh, but essentially you can do the same thing and generalize uh, these TAP equations and they are consistent with uh, results that, that have been done uh, uh, before. Uh, I think uh, assuming that entries are IID. Okay, so of course uh, this is all embedded in, in related work. And I think uh, the first person who uh, looked into solving TAP equations with uh, an algorithm that came out of message passing was the approximate message passing algorithm uh, um, that uh, um, uh, Kawashima looked into. And surprisingly, even if it's a Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, and if you do naive iterations of uh, these TAP equations, you, you, you um, miserably fail, but uh, Kawashima got some, some nice results. It's always surprising me that it was so simple. Uh, later, um, 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 Bolthausen showed exact uh, results um, uh, for this AMP algorithm. Then it was uh, generalized later to, to um, to uh, uh, um, other problems and uh, uh, further generalized also to uh, these random matrix ensembles. And uh, since essentially the outcome of these calculations were sort of um, called a density evolution equations, in some sense, one step updates of temporal order parameters that tell you something, uh, um, how, uh, for instance, in the inference, uh, your overlap will be to the true uh, um, um, vector the, to the true uh, uh, teacher or something like that. And uh, sort of our contributions um, are slightly different. So all these uh, methods are um, based on, on uh, most of the methods are, are based on rigorous uh, stuff. And I think we can get at the moment a slightly more uh, information by using a statistical physics approach and that is this dynamical functional approach. So we get a full dynamical solution essentially for single, uh, for single variables. And it might also give us an idea why this dynamics is so simple. So um, I just only show the algorithm for solving the TAP equations for the Ising case. So this specific in initialization that makes you uh, a life uh, simpler. So what you do, is doing something like that looks a little bit like a recurrent neural network update. So first of all, you do a, a local computation. So you have some hyperbolic tangents as usually for Ising models. So um, it looks slightly, here's some linear part, here's some hyperbolic tangent. And then you have an operation where you multiply this whole thing by, uh, um, by a matrix, so you have this matrix multiplication and then a, a pointwise nonlinear compu computation. So it's a fairly 
um, a simple kind of update, and this matrix is chosen in a, in a, in a strange way relating uh, uh, to this coupling matrix J. So we can later ask what kind of properties makes life simple for these kind of updates. So this is uh, an algorithm and uh, well, you have to compute uh, certain parameters uh, uh, beforehand. So now the idea is to use uh, a statistical uh, mechanics approach. Um, so if you write these uh, coupled equations in the following way, so a nonlinear operation uh, acting on a vector gamma. The gamma is then, uh, um, um, the new gamma is then obtained by multiplying by a matrix. And so the idea would be to study the statistical properties of trajectories of this algorithm um, um, by a uh, partition uh, function, by a path integral method, essentially. So where you say, I introduce a, uh, a path integral that uh, essentially computes um, uh, everything by putting the dynamics into delta functions. So the only contribution uh, comes in uh, if you fulfill, if your uh, dynamics fulfills these uh, dynamical equations, so within delta functions, and then you do an averaging over this generating functionals. And from that you obtain, uh, you can obtain the statistics. And of course, the idea would be for the large system that you can sort of approximate this um, expectation and actually decouple the degrees of freedom. Uh, so here the couplings between I and J. So the idea is to achieve that. So it's similar in a replica calculation where you do uh, Z to the power of N, you take your average and then you see uh, using saddle point uh, uh, methods, you can always decouple the degrees of freedom. So that happens uh, also in this uh, uh, method. So that has been used for many years in, in, in the spin glass community. And so surprise, surprise, when you do this, and uh, it's a little bit of uh, technicalities, but at the end of the day, you get a, an effective stochastic process of a single variable. So this thing, um, you apply a pointwise of nonlinear function on some field gamma. So that was already there before because that is a single, uh, um, a single variable operation. But now this uh, multiplication by matrices essentially says, oh, this variable gamma um, has a memory on the variable gamma tilde at previous times. And there is an incoherent effect of all this, multipli um, of this multiplication by a random matrix, which is uh, then encoded in a Gaussian uh, distribution. And you can compute this uh, memory term in a complicated way. So that depends on some function of the linear response function uh, where you look at the memory, uh, how does gamma tilde uh, change when you change uh, the field at previous time. So this is all very technical and looks very ugly. And uh, uh, the problem is that normally you would have to stop here because there's not so much you can do in general. And there's only a few uh, models where you can sort of go ahead. And these are of course linear models. You can do everything as, if things are linear. Um, if the matrices are not uh, symmetric matrix, but completely uh, random. So for the non-symmetric case, uh, the memory terms, which make life really hard because, you know, uh, you, you have a, a stochastic process it, 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 um, where, where your variable depends on, on the past and you have non-linearities and these memories uh, vanish. Um, uh, that has been uh, um, looked at uh, very much in the 90s for uh, uh, neural network models. Of course, there's a, a very famous work on p-spin uh, models where you actually have the um, have um, uh, uh, correlation and response functions together, but you manage to uh, get uh, coupled uh, nonlinear um, integral equations for these correlation response functions, and somehow you get you're, you're able to do all these averages, and you end up with coupled integral equations. And also something similar has been uh, established uh, uh, recently for um, a mixture classification problems by uh, also by Lenka and, and collaborators. <laughs>
Okay, so in our case, we have a slightly different model. It's non, it's 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 not a, a, a completely a random a non symmetric matrix. Uh, we don't have this simplification here. So in general, it would be uh, not tractable, and we would have ended with the same kind of problem. So rather solving, uh, um, rather yeah, sticking to simulation of the whole system, but actually. Uh, things uh, turn out uh, a bit simpler. So for the choice of the dynamics that we made, uh, the memory terms completely disappear. And that was really surprising to me that these memory terms can disappear um, because for all these other spin glass problems, everything was so horrible. And uh, now we end up really with a very simple single site dynamics. So these fields depend on a nonlinear function but the nonlinear, um, the, uh, the argument of the nonlinear function is a Gaussian random variable. There's an explicit way of computing the covariance over time uh, uh, for these Gaussian random variables. Of course, you have to do a little bit of numerics, but essentially this is a single one-step uh, 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 dynamics, uh, which is driven by some Gaussian noise. The Gaussian noise has certain correlations. And uh, so at the end of the day, uh, you can solve things, and it means you can get uh, right uh, nice uh, and, and simple recursion uh, um, equations for the covariance matrix of these gammas, and you can show how fast uh, you get convergence to a fixed point under some conditions. And here are some simple examples uh, where we have a, a specific uh, uh, um, Ising model uh, that is known as a two-layer hop field. Uh, there's a it's a simple way of constructing such a rotationally invariant uh, matrix by concatenating uh, Gaussian matrices and taking out the products. But here is just simply a, uh, um, a display of the mean squared error in uh, uh, um, the logarithmic uh, mean squared error of the covariance matrix over uh, between uh, these fields at different time steps. Uh, from over time steps. And here you see this is really, it's a 10 log, uh, this is pretty small. And what is shown is not some averaging over many instances, it's really a single instant of a problem uh, from, a, from a random uh, matrix. And uh, uh, similarly, you can show how fast the algorithm converges. So it's actually, it's a difference between um, uh, the quantity that you update uh, at two time steps, and you see how fast this uh, goes to zero. So the uh, blue things are again um, simulate um, um, uh, results uh, from simulations on a single instance, and the red dashed are given by the asymptotic uh, decay of the error that you can compute analytically. And you can, of course, go a little bit away from the theory by saying, okay, rotationally invariant, maybe. Uh, we can do a little bit more and uh, looking into uh, um, other types of things where these um, uh, random matrices O are not really uh, um, really a rotation, random rotations, but where you have essentially discrete uh, representations of this O tilde, and that is known as an Hadamard as ensemble. Again, something popular in uh, random matrix theory where you have where you expect similar behaviors in the large n limit uh, from uh, really uh, rotationally invariant ensembles. And again, so the theory looks pretty simple, uh, um, similar. And, and uh, so when you go here, these are always regions when you are close to the instability that you know, the Dalmaida Thaulis line. And of course, you might expect uh, things uh, that are not uh, uh, going so nice anymore. Um, when you go close to an instability. And the instability that you know from spin glass theory is also reflecting itself uh, by a failure of convergence. So the convergent times gets slower and slower and diverges at, at the uh, instability. And uh, you get a similar thing when you use these uh, generalized linear model or the Gaussian uh, latent variable models. Uh, here's a um, um, perceptron example. So this is again the decay of the error of the algorithm as compared to, to the asymptotic theory. And you get also some results for uh, random um, matrix models when you look uh, at uh, Boltzmann machines.
So this is all some, yeah, we can do this, we can do that. And uh, the question is, of course, why? Well, we tried to interpret why did it, uh, um, why did these things become reasonably simple at the end of the day? And what is it that we can even write uh, down a simple results for the asymptotic uh, uh, decay uh, of the algorithm, which I'm not showing here. But um, so if we really look uh, back at the algorithm and then um, looking uh, at uh, the quantity that introduces the um, self-couplings over time in dynamical functional theory. So dynamical functional th theory essentially tries to include um, the effect that a variable knows uh, about itself at the past through the interactions of the random matrix. And so somehow this is reflected by some kind of uh, response function. So the response function is, res is uh, responsible for uh, this memory effect. And we want to ask this ourselves, why is the dynamical response for these kind of models actually absent? So that made it simply uh, solvable, usually because of the interactions, the variable feels its presence at the, at, at the past, uh, which is kind of uh, a way of, 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 of taking uh, track of the interactions that we have. And if we look at this dynamical uh, response and a uh, response function is always something, yeah, that involves matrix multiplication. So you linearize the dynamics. And so if you write down what you have to do, you get products of matrices and the matrix A is essentially the matrix that I have introduced. It's a random matrix, the, random, the matrix E. So you, if you linearize the dynamics, there will be some matrix A involved. If I linearize that part of the dynamics that uh, since it's only a pointwise uh, operation, it's going to be uh, a diagonal matrix. So there will always be uh, a concatenation of a random matrix, a diagonal matrix, a random matrix and so on and so forth. Now these two matrices A and E have very simple properties because at least in the limit N to infinity, they have their normalized traces are zero. So these are trace-free matrices. And our conjecture is, which is supported a little bit uh, by random matrix uh, theory and uh, essentially something that's known as uh, asymptotic freeness is if you have such a matrix multiplication where you multiply the random matrix by a diagonal one, then essentially these products, the trace of the products converges to zero for n to infinity. Of course, the, um, the conditions that you need to uh, prove this uh, um, uh, rigorously are not fulfilled here because you, what you would need is that these matrices E and the matrix A are independent random matrices. That's of course not fulfilled. So these two neighbors are somehow depending on each others because uh, they contain the same uh, random variables, but um, sort of doing a bit of hand waving and assuming you can neglect uh, these kind of dependencies uh, would suggest to say, if we built algorithms uh, in such a way that uh, the linearized dynamics is always a trace-free kind of thing, then we will get, uh, um, uh, then we will get uh, essentially uh, 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 response functions that are zero. And that means we will get no memory terms in dynamical functional theory, and we can really apply it as a simple uh, tool to get explicit uh, results uh, for the performance of the algorithm. Okay, so that's kind of the story. Okay, just, just an interruption, we are in the discussion time. So if you want to keep some time for the discussion, if you could Yeah, that's it, so up. essentially it's, it's perfect. So uh, so yeah, that's, that's where we are. And what we are doing uh, at the moment or try to do is to uh, go from the uh, discrete iteration into uh, sequential updates or random sequential updates or stochastic gradient descent, which is quite related. And of course, if we think in terms of um, RBM learning, then the coupling matrices would get a statistics, of course, uh, from the learning. And it's not clear how this uh, statistics uh, would uh, also fit into that random matrix theory 
Uh, we try to make uh, things rigorous, as rigorous as possible. And of course, the big question is always, you know, how, uh, in, uh, how well might real data be describable by these uh, random matrix construction? How much is surviving in the real world? I don't know that. So we try to first get uh, some mathematics done and then try it out. And of course, it's always important to say where you got your money from, that's a DFG grant. Okay. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, Manfred. So we have a few, few minutes for the discussion. So do we have questions for Manfred? Anybody feel free. Tom, Tom is raising hand. Uh, hi, Manfred. Just, it's not a question, sure. but just um, a, another example that sort of underlines your hunch about the absence of the retarded self interaction. Mm -hmm. Another example where it happens if you look at sequence processing hop field models with extensive number of patterns that was also solved with generating functionals. And also there you see that the retarded self interaction goes, but the non-trivial noise statistics is still there. Yes, yes, that's the same, that's the same as here, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a that? situation, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's, it's a more recent stuff of yours or, or an older oh, one? This, this, this is late 1980, 99. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Are there more comments, questions? Anybody? Well, I already asked my questions last time. I heard my friend talking <laughs> about related things, so, okay. so I kind of exhausted them. So if there ones, then maybe we can use the time to, to catch up a little bit since we are running a little bit late. Thank you, Manfred, for presenting his work. And move to the third contribution of this okay. afternoon. Mm -hmm. Okay, see so you. I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing. Yep. Okay.